So uh, first, again, welcome. Uh, really excited with the response we have. Excited to have so much experience here. And uh, yeah, just really um, great to keep this, this movement going forward with American bulldog control in the West. Okay, um, I mentioned the Jamboard already. This is a snapshot of one of the pages uh, that's up there right now. Slides, I don't know what they're called. Um, one of the introductory Jamboards. Um, just to demonstrate, if you haven't been there already, there's a whole lot going on over here already. And uh, this can help you build connections with folks um, that are thinking about similar issues, or um, you can find some experts in here based on the responses to the sticky notes as well. So we do encourage you to visit that. So to take a small step back, I'm gonna provide just a really brief background on a program called CCAST, uh, the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox which is the infrastructure um, allowing us to have this workshop today. Um, and we're gonna talk for a few minutes about how we're addressing American bullfrog control uh, through a non-native aquatic species community of practice. Um, so CCAST is a, um, a platform that, um, that was launched in late 2017 as an information sharing platform and peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange platform. Uh, through multiple partnerships that Genevieve Johnson, Larry Fisher, and I were working on, we heard the call for increased uh, knowledge exchange through case studies on uh, questions that come up in all of our partnerships, really. Um, who's doing what, where, what's working, what isn't, and I, you know, establishing ways for us to work together. To go a little bit deeper, we work on establishing communities of practice like the Non-Native Aquatic Species Group uh, to support managers and folks like you all that are here for this workshop and are collaborating to develop actionable science and tools uh, to help folks get unstuck and tackle some of these really big challenges like invasive species and American bullfrogs. To, um, so a little more here on the communities of practice. Um, I think this is a, just a Google definition that we've adopted as our um, community of practice. So a group of individuals that regularly interacts to learn how to more effectively conduct their work and achieve common goals. The three main bends of our community of practice work are knowledge exchange through case studies, webinars, and workshops like this one, um, tool development, responding to the needs of partners, and then identifying opportunities for collaborative action where there's a need for um, an action, but there's nobody there to facilitate um, moving things forward, and that's what we try to do. Um, you won't see any geographic boundaries on the work we do. We try to focus on issues instead of states or other jurisdictions and respond to the scale of issues like non-native aquatic species. And um, bullfrogs are an obvious example where um, going into this topic has really brought together folks from across the West and then recently expanded as we find out more and more um, concerns about bullfrogs, even in areas where they are native, uh, but maybe expanding. Uh, two other communities of practice that we support are drought and climate adaptation and grassland conservation and restoration, uh, which are here in the slide just for your information, but we're not going to dive into those, obviously, now. So non-native aquatic species, COP, uh, launched about two years ago after we identified with our partners that there was a lack of facilitation around the issue of a, a introduced aquatic species. Um, especially those species that are not uniformly on aquatic nuisance or aquatic invasive species list. Um, so we're using the CCAS model to support addressing this, this gap through case studies and the other things that we talked about in the previous slides, um, as well as uh, tools that I'm not really gonna dive into right now. Um, that said, if this is new to you and you want to stay informed through the communities of practice, uh, through the community of practice, you can email me or Christy and somebody from the CCAS team could drop our emails into the chat, that would be helpful. And um, we have additional resources to share, including our goals and objectives document, which I don't think we shared prior to this meeting. Really quickly, what we've done on bullfrog so far, uh, we've completed six case studies on bullfrog control from uh, Southern Canada to California to Southern Arizona, hosted a few webinars on those control projects uh, that have reached a pretty large audience, uh, something like what we have here today. Um, we hosted a three-part workshop series last year uh, that brought together what we thought at the time was a large number of attendees at 72. Uh, one thing I've been able to do through the Science Applications Program and Fish and Wildlife Service is use this um, 
co-identification of research needs as leverage to get funding from leadership. And today we funded over $500,000 in American bullfrog research through projects, um, yeah, primarily in Arizona so far. Um, three parts to the 2021 workshop series. We had three sessions um, on the three topics there and I need to keep moving because I'm talking too much already. But the takeaways from that workshop, um, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, uh, bullfrogs are a major challenge, which probably isn't a surprise to anybody here, but it, the scale of this issue was a surprise to those of us within CCAST. Um, we also have heard from a few of our case study examples that eradication is possible, uh, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of maintenance, which we'll talk about in our breakout sessions today. Um, we also identified that we need to find a way to do a better job educating the public on bullfrog issues. Um, and there's a whole human dimensions component to um, bullfrog introductions, of course, and other management issues that um, I should keep at a high level for now. And then generally, which, you know, you hear this around multiple conservation topics, increased communication, coordination. Um, and that's one thing we're trying to do through uh, work like here today. Um, I'm gonna breeze through this pretty quickly. Um, but one thing we did during a workshop last year was go through a series of questions on how important bullfrog control was for conservation of uh, species in need of conservation. And we walked through a list of, I think about 26 species and removal was necessary preferred almost throughout all of those. Um, there was never a case where removal was not recommended for any of those species that were brought up in this discussion. And if nothing else, this has been a really powerful communication piece for folks like me when we talk to regional leadership about how big the uh, bullfrog control issue is. So what are we doing now? Um, we've heard a really large call for work on this and we're trying to respond with the capacity that we have. And what we're trying to do through this workshop series, um, right now there's only one, but we are planning to be on it being a series to help to make, uh, develop recommended practices through um, the lens of these three pilot geographies that we'll hear about more here. And through the series, um, we want to explore with the experts and managers for these different geographies, if bull contr bullfrog control is required to achieve management objectives, talk about feasibility. And then today we'll be talking a lot about just what information is needed when you're in the initial planning phases. Uh, depending on how these conversations go and the follow-ups with the three pilot geographies today, uh, we're gonna figure out what's next in terms of a workshop series and how we can help these three groups. Um, but also um, a parallel need that has come up is the need for development of a recommended uh, bullfrog control guidance document, uh, framework and document. I've, we're still changing the words regularly on what we're, that's gonna be called, uh, but we are planning to work with a small work group to um, develop a guidance, standardized guidance document that we hope could be adopted throughout um, throughout the community here. Really quickly, um, CCAST team, um, and with some pictures here, uh, myself with Fish and Wildlife Services Science Applications Program, uh, Genevieve Johnson and Dina Morell over here on the right from the Bureau of Reclamation, um, University of Arizona School of Natural Resources and the Environment, uh, Larry Fisher as the, federal, uh, the University Co-Director of CCAST, um, we have Christy, Anna, and Ariel are the coordinators, and I should give a special shout out to Christy, who's the coordinator of the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice. And we also have two students joining us today. This um, CCAS works with a pretty large group of interns, primarily at the University of Arizona uh, for all things CCAST. And if you see Nick Katz and Nicole Williams here, uh, there are two of our current interns that are supporting the workshop today. So. Be nice to them, say hi, and thank you, uh, Nick and Nicole, for um, squeezing us in between classes here. Um, so session one today, uh, we're gonna go through an orientation to these pilot project sites, and then have uh, breakouts for expert manager discussions on goal setting and basement data. And we will be working on scoping out future sessions, partially based on what we've already heard, and also in response to feedback that we get today. Um, so hopefully that's it. Uh, I see Christy's back on camera. I'm sure I'm over time already. So uh, Christy, I think I'm ready to hand it over to you. 
Sounds great. Thanks, Matt, for that introduction. Um, we're going to roll right into these presentations. Um, just a quick note, if you have questions during these presentations, please enter them into the chat as we go along. And I will relay them to the presenters after um, time permitting. Uh, we're going to do our best to stay on, stay on time. Also just wanted to point out that the agenda we sent to all of you um, likely has a different order of speakers. Um, so today we're going to hear from the Archers Group, followed by Kaibab, National Forest, and then the Fish Springs Group. Um, so just a little note on that. But first, um, our first speaker will be uh, Melissa Tremel. She is a fishery biologist for the National Park Service and will be presenting on bullfrogs in Arches National Park, Utah. So I'll hand it over to you, Melissa. Thanks, Christy. Let's see if I can share my screen successfully. And I'll start the presentation. All right, do you see it? <laughs> yep, looks good. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, bullfrogs of Sleepy Hollow, which is in Arches National Park in Southeast Utah. Um, I'm Melissa Trammell, the Regional Fisheries Biologist for the Legacy Intermountain Region. And um, I have co-authors, um, Nick Medley from Water Resource Division, uh, fisheries biologist at the national level and also met and Skoyak, the park ecologist and research coordinator for um, actually the Southeast Utah group, which includes arches as well as Canyonlands and um, some other adjacent parks. And I hope you guys are on today in case I have um, additional questions from the audience, you can help me answer them. All right, so people come to the Arches National Park. Uh, you know, mostly they, uh, have an idea that it is a, an enormous desert landscape full of iconic arches and um, they don't really necessarily think of it in terms of having water but it actually does border the Colorado River here and there are uh, two permanent streams uh, with intermittent uh, sections above and um, here this little red dot is our tiny little sleepy hollow spot that we are kind of focusing in on today. Um, the, yeah, so there's one of your iconic desert arches surrounded by desert landscapes. But here again, it's just um, an amazing amount of water in arches. You'd be, you'd be surprised. I was certainly surprised once I started um, hiking around in there with the park folks that knew about it. But there's um, Freshwater Canyon as a spring fed system um, in, as part of salt wash that um, may serve as a refuge to some of the native amphibians. Um, there are other, um, uh, lots of aquatic life in there. There's a beaver dams, there's all sorts of like turkeys and bears and foxes and waterfowl and mostly non-native fishes as well as native amphibians. Um, so a number of years ago, the park staff kind of noticed that their native amphibians were declining, particularly um, the leopard frog. And so they submitted a request for assistance from uh, regional fisheries biologists and uh, Nick Medley, the, the um, Water Resources Division Wildlife Aquatic Ecologist, um, to evaluate the situation and hopefully provide recommendations for some plausible and practical actions that might limit the bullfrogs and protect the native aquatics. But um, so that's where uh, we got involved, Nick and I. And this is very much in line with the National Park Service management policies that calls for management of exotic species, uh, which would not be allowed to displace native species if it can be prevented. And um, they will be managed up to and including eradication if control is prudent and feasible and the exotic species interferes with natural process or disrupts the genetic integrity of native species. And so bullfrogs certainly um, meet all of those qualifications. Um, the park yes, is home to at least five uh, native amphibians. They're kind of the usual complement for um, the southeast area. We have red spotted toads, woodhouse toad, Kenyan tree frogs, northern leopard frog, 
great basin spade foots. And this little um, red spotted toad number one here, that is in fact the only specimen of native amphibian that we found during our surveys of the park, that little guy right there. So um, we sampled several areas. We tried to focus in on uh, areas that were known to have pretty permanent water and also um, uh, known to have at one time hosted native amphibians and also where folks had noticed um, bullfrogs and some other native uh, invasive, or sorry, aquatic invasive species. And so we, um, looked at uh, uh, salt wash, which is uh, in the upper right-hand corner, as well as courthouse wash, uh, a couple of different areas there where we focused on uh, down by the mouth, kind of in a middle section, and our little sleepy hollow area. Um, so each, um, each of these areas does connect to the Colorado River uh, during rain events or wet periods. And um, uh, especially the, the, the perennial parts of those streams down near the Colorado River have always um, have access to the aquatic invasives in the Colorado River. <clears throat> Our sampling methods that we used um, include just spot sampling with uh, backpack collector fishers, minnow traps, seines, and just visually observing um, uh, things like adult bullfrogs. And so just as a quick result, we did notice that each area held bullfrogs and green sunfish, other non-native fish, as well as um, uh, northern crayfish. And again, um, these areas are really very special, um, uh, rare habitats in such a desert area as the whole Moab area and arches in particular. But there are some amazing springs in there, Wall Spring and Salt Creek, the water's just gushing out of the wall there. Uh, that happens all the time, apparently. <laughs> um, uh, we had our first documentation of otter up in arches um, in Courthouse Wash. Um, we did uh, use seines as our main collection device. It seemed to be the most effective in the um, variety of habitats that we were looking at. And then our typical catch, that's really kind of the trifecta there of green sunfish, large bullfrog tadpoles, and crayfish. So we're, we're a bit data poor, so I put lots of pictures in. Um, so in Sleepy Hollow, um, this area up here was of particular concern to the park because the, in that area up in the above on the canyon, top of the canyon, there's a lot of new commercial development and new water supply wells have been um, drilled. Uh, which led to concern about the, the impact to the local springs, including uh, the Sleepy Hollow Spring. And so the park has been monitoring water quality and outflow for several years. And while they were doing that, the staff observed fish in the pond for the first time, which, um, which led to our sampling this area in particular. Um, historically, this pond has been very consistent. Um, it uh, and see, there's a, the story that was told that in the 50s, people would drive down the canyon from the north on hot summer days to swim and party in the cool waters of Sleepy Hollow Pond. So this pond has been uh, there in the park for a long time. It is largely uh, isolated from other waters, except during rainstorms. Uh, there's a pool at the bottom of a pour over. It is spring fed as well as rain fed. and um, there's been some new developments since we were there in 2015. In uh, 2021, they started to notice um, uh, beaver have been building a dam just below the outlet of the spring. So that may complicate things a bit. Um, just focusing in again, here's the actual pond area. It is not very big. It is about 50 uh, feet by 50 feet, less than a 10th of an acre. Um, it's accessed by uh, about a three mile trail that starts at the uh, Highway 191 that goes down to Moab. Um, or you can access it. There's a nine to 10 mile trail that goes up from the bottom of Courthouse Wash. Uh, it's, uh, it's about five to six feet deep. We 
um, did not actually go out to the middle and find out, but it was um, at least six feet deep. Uh, there are no roads, except that closest one is uh, three miles away. And public visitation is actually pretty low. I don't think a lot of people know about this area. Uh, here's a roughly stitched together panorama. Um, you can see that it is pretty steep on one side and it's more gradual on the, um, the other three sides of it with uh, quite a bit of aquatic vegetation or you know wetland vegetation as well as uh, cottonwoods and other um, shrubs. I'm not a, not a plant biologist so <laughs> Matt might want to join in and tell us what they were. Um, you know it's I was wondering if it might hold some, you know, kind of rare endemic aquatic invertebrates, but um, none have been identified so far. So um, there are certainly aquatic invertebrates there, but not any that are specific to this area, to this one pond. So we got in there with our sayings and um, just to see what we would find. And sure enough, we did find um, a number of adult green sunfish, as well as hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bullfrog tadpoles. <laughs> so uh, we recognize that there was a there was an ongoing problem here. The small stream uh, that um, comes out of the pond uh, actually quickly disappears into the sand and doesn't reach the main canyon bottom. So um, that is partially part of the isolation of the pond, but there's, um, you know, an amazing amount of wildlife around it. There was a deer there, we saw a mountain lion, there was bear scat, we saw turkey tracks and fox tracks. And so it is, a, you know, definitely a, a water source and an important habitat for a number of wildlife species. And then here's some activity that happened between September 2021 and January 2022, in that the beavers uh, did start gnawing away on this tree um, in the foreground, although they have not felled it yet. But um, the one behind it on the left, they had um, gnawed completely through and, and um, dropped that tree by January 2022. Um, this uh, this new beaver pond or beaver dam actually backs water up into the main pond a little bit, and um, it also disrupted along the long term monitoring site where they had been um, measuring the stream outflow. And the decision was made to not disturb the beavers and um, allow that process to take place, even though they were losing their long term monitoring sites. But um, it's possible that that could complicate the actual um, bullfrog control. I wanted to talk a little bit about the connectivity to other aquatic habitats. And so Sleepy Hollow uh, is, you know, kind of at the, the middle area of Cottonwood Wash. Uh, it is nine to 10 miles measured on Google Earth down, from Sleepy Hollow down to the Colorado River. There are springs all along here. Um, in the tributaries as well as the main wash and the system gathers water and so it is perennial near the mouth. Uh, this provides intermittent but frequent access for aquatic invasive species. Um, bullfrog tadpoles and adults were found throughout and um, I suspect if there was um, some sort of a treatment that we could do in the main wash um, there would be a, quite a bit of refuge for adult bull bullfrogs in the tributaries. It's also um, quite a popular hiking area. And down here, um, close to the mouth, was where we found our only native round-tailed chub, native fish species captured in a pool near the mouth. And uh, this is the only place also where we found um, you know, a few <laughs> speckled dates, also a native fish species. Um, so here, yeah, it's just a view of uh, one of the tributary uh, intersections. And if you follow that up on Google Earth, Earth or on foot, you can see some, some spring activity there. So that's why, it's a, that's why it gathers water as it goes downstream. Here's the mouth area. You can see it's, it has influence from the Colorado River, which at this um, flow level 
not sure what flow level that was. Um, it's backed the straight, uh, backed up quite a ways up into courthouse wash. So in 2015, our project conclusions were that uh, non-native fish actually uh, represented almost 100% of the total number of fish captured, except for one site where we did catch several speckled days. Um, for amphibians, we observed six adult bullfrogs. Uh, we sampled twice. We sampled in April and September. And so our spring sampling, we didn't see any egg masses or tadpoles yet, but in um, in the fall sampling, we did see you know, hundreds and hundreds of bullfrog tadpoles and no native uh, amphibian tadpoles, just the one adult red spotted toad. And then crayfish were um, surprisingly abundant, northern crayfish as well. And so we observed that you know, these AIS species have likely originated in the Colorado River and they've been moving upstream have infested all their accessible perennial aquatic habitat within arches, um, leaving only perhaps a few small areas above natural barriers. And um, we had quite a bit of discussion about it, which I won't actually repeat here. We can do that in the workout section um, or breakout sections, but we did, we could not determine that there were any practical means of eliminating bullfrogs or the non-native fish or crayfish in National Park. So, but since then, <laughs> we've been, um, you know, listening in on these CCAST uh, presentations and it, it gave me at least a little bit of hope that um, perhaps, you know, some new methods and, and strategies have been developed. And so um, I wanted to take a closer look at least at uh, Sleepy Hollow, even though it is a you know a small area, I thought you know that's maybe we could apply something there, and learn from it and move out from there. So our 2015 recommendations did not actually um, recommend removing any bullfrogs, but um, in 2021 I am changing that re recommendation, um, and that's how we got involved in this workshop. And for our goals um, for the workshop and beyond, our primary goal is to uh, attempt to restore Sleepy Hollow by eradicating the bullfrogs and green sunfish. And then um, if we have some success there, we'd like to restore additional areas within the park. However, there are of course a number of limitations to doing this, not alone is um, you know, lack of funding, staff numbers and expertise within the park. Um, the known high connectivity to sources of AIS in the Colorado River. So I, that is an area that I think that we will never be able to um, control that access. And um, another point I didn't really um, demonstrate earlier was that there's a high risk of flash flooding in this area. The monsoons have just huge flows through all the creeks. And so um, attempts to build screens or barriers or any kind of infrastructure to control the movement of these species would be pretty problematic because, um, because of that um, flash flooding. So I'll leave you with a few questions for the breakout section. Um, I can put these up again when we're in our breakout. Um, but yeah, I mean, the big question is, should we even try this? Is it um, is it possible to reduce, suppress, or eliminate bullfrogs? Um, you know, I know chemical treatments are possible, but we'd be concerned about other resources. And uh, what's the best way to eliminate bullfrogs in the semi-isolated pond and how to keep them from reinvading? What is the smallest area that we could treat and be successful? Or perhaps I should have said, what's the largest area we could treat and be successful since I think um, the large areas will be extremely difficult and Sleepy Hollow um, might be possible, but there's still intermittent access to I AIS from nearby waters. And if we can do it at all, what might be the frequency um, that we might have to repeat that given that um, likelihood of reinvasion? So that's all I had. And Nick or Matt, if you are on the line, uh, feel free to jump in and add anything. Thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, oh, 
Oh, I don't know. I'm just going to say hi. And um, do I have anything to add? No, I think Melissa actually covered it very well. It's, uh, it's a tough situation. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. I appreciate it. That was good. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank um, you all. Talk later. Let's see. Stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, and we're going to go ahead and move on to the next presentation. Um, but anyone from Arches, there are a couple questions. If you don't mind trying to answer those in the chat. Um, first one, main one being how long have the bullfrogs been there in Sleepy Hollow? So if you don't mind taking some time to just answer that in the chat for the sake of time, and I will move us along to the Kaibab presentation. Um, so for this next presentation, uh, Valerie Stein Foster uh, will be presenting. She is the Acting Wildlife Program Manager for the Southern Region of the for U.S. Forest Service. And will be presenting on bullfrogs at Kaibab National Forest in Arizona. It's all yours, Valerie. Okay, can you hear me, Christy? And can you see my screen? We can hear you, Valerie, but can't see your screen. Yes. <laughs> How about now? Yes, now we can. Perfect. Okay, great, success. Okay, so I'll just, um, I'll jump right into it um, and kind of give you some kind of overview of the context and setting the existing condition and, and kind of why we're wanting to possibly remove bullfrogs on the Kaibab National Forest. Um, we're located here in um, North Central Arizona, um, if you're not familiar with this part of the country. Um, we are geographically uh, separated into basically two different zones um, by the Grand Canyon National Park. Um, so the Kaibab is kind of this, this grayed out section here. Um, we have kind of our, our northern zone, which is the North Kaibab Ranger District. And then the southern zone of the forest is actually two ranger districts, Tucson and Williams. Uh, down here. And for the purposes of, of this workshop and, and discussion, um, we'll be focusing down here on this, this William, Williams Ranger District area, which is about, oh, a little over 550,000 acres in, in spatial extent. Um, this, lot, this highway here, um, I just want to point this out. This is Interstate I-40. This is a very heavily um, traveled highway uh, lots of stopover tra traffic, and it's uh, um, people coming to stop and recreate in the area, and um, it's a heavy uh, trucking route as well. Um, we have our neighbors down here. We have the Prescott National Forest, Coconino National Forest as well, um, and we are uh, also um, surrounded by um, tribal lands as well. Um, we have quite a bit of diversity. Uh, elevation ranges from about 3,000 to uh, about 10,000 elevation. Um, number of different ecosystems, ponderosa pine, pinyon juniper woodlands are the kind of primary systems. We also have mixed conifer and aspen, um, desert communities, um, sagebrush, uh, shrubland areas, and, and also um, uh, uh, some water, but not much. Um, we're actually a very dry forest. Um, we have very little natural water. Uh, most of our uh, natural water is ephemeral um, or underground, and, and we have a lot of earthen um, stock tanks and humid, human-made structures. So I'll just kind of talk about, kind of tee this up and talk a little bit about kind of the underlying policy and, and kind of some of the objectives um, that we have on the forest and why we're thinking about um, removing bullfrogs. Um, we revised our land and resource management plan in uh, 2014, and throughout through that process, when we were revising our land management plan or our forest plan, as we refer to it, um, we identified some some themes, some priority needs for change. And and one of the priority needs that that we came up with was to restore um, ecological function um, in some of our natural waters and our wetlands. 
And so we do have some very specific direction in our forest plan that kind of, um, you know, serves to serves to guide us in that direction. Um, we have basically these these kind of these three major kind of types of water or, or ecosystems that could potentially serve as habitat uh, for aquatic species. So we have our wetland uh, Cienega system. And um, I've just kind of like highlighted some of the language in terms of what the desired condition is, what's our end goal, and what, what we want these systems to look like. Um, so we want them to have native plant and animal species, healthy populations, um, and we want to make sure that they're free or uh, minimally impacted by non-native predation and diseases or unwanted um, non-native species. Um, we also have um, constructed water, so uh, human-made features, um, earthen stock ponds, uh, trick tanks, guzzlers, um, these features um, predominantly service, um, they may service wi wildlife or um, livestock uh, watering sources. And so we also have desired conditions for those water features as well. We want to make sure they're not spreading unwanted um, non-native species or diseases potentially like chytrid fungus. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention too about our na natural waters and our, our, our wetlands, Cienegas, um, uh, these do hold um, cultural value in our area. Some of them are um, valued by our tribes, uh, tribal partners, as well as um, spiritual value for folks that might be recreating on the forest as well. Um, related to the ecosystems or these um, vegetation or habitat types, we also have some very specific language um, for our wildlife species. So this is, um, this is broad across kind of all habitat types, um, but uh, certainly relates to um, aquatic systems or the um, vegetation types I mentioned before. Um, we want to make sure that our native wildlife species are distributed throughout their potential natural range. Um, that we do have habitat and refugia for some of our narrow endemics. We do have um, fairly high levels of endemism on the forest, uh, particularly on the northern zone. And we want to make sure that um, uh, we're not adding to any further decline that those, those species are doing okay. And then we have um, specific um, direction um, in terms of providing quality habitat for our um, federally listed species under ESA and then also our sensitive species. And then related to that, um, again, we have direction for invasive species. We want to make sure that they're contained and controlled and they're not disrupting uh, ecological integrity and the biological function uh, in those systems. So just a little bit more on forest plan implementation. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we revised our forest plan uh, earlier, um, about 2014, I think. So we've been implementing it, I guess, for uh, eight years or so now. Um, and kind of nested under those desired conditions. Those desired conditions I talked about previously, they're kind of the picture that we're painting, where we're you know, going, kind of the overall goal or vision. And then uh, nested under that, um, we have uh, very specific objectives um, related to, uh, in this case, related to the wetlands and the natural waters I mentioned earlier. Um, we want to look at restoration work in those areas, both in terms of the vegetation and the hydrologic flow. Um, and, and we do have specific goals to, to restore those in the next um, several years. And so um, restoring native species um, in those areas um, is certainly tied to that. And so um, we do have some related actions and opportunities that could help to inform those objectives and, and move us towards our ultimate goal uh, that's framed in those desired conditions. Um, and so for the purposes of this talk, um, we're talking about non-native species removal, bullfrogs, and potentially native species repatriation, repatriation uh, specifically um, northern leopard frog. And then kind of the last, um, the last piece related to the forest plan I'll just touch on here a bit is um, related to connectivity. Um, our, our most recent planning rule, 2012 planning rule, does explicitly define connectivity. And, um, you know, that's something that we also defined in our, our forest plan. We want to make sure that we have um, the appropriate uh, configuration and availability of habitat for um, for these different species, 
um, and that we're, they're able to adjust their movement as, as perhaps climate change starts happening. Um, and that also that, that we can maintain some, some level of ge genetic flow, genetic diversity. Um, and I think that, you know, I just wanted to stop here for a minute. Um, this can pose some interesting challenges, I think, when we're, we're, we're looking at managing um, undesirable species versus desirable species, um, you know, in terms of, you know, the connectivity being a good thing potentially for, for northern leopard frogs, but maybe not such a good thing when we're thinking about uh, bullfrogs and not wanting them to um, disperse across, whoops, disperse across the landscape. So that's just a question I'll throw out there to maybe um, chew on because it's something that I have been thinking about. So I touched on northern leopard frog. Um, that is one of our regionally sensitive species. It is a species that we do have some viability concerns. We wanna make sure that um, their populations are stable. Um, we don't want the species to become listed. And so this is, this is something that we're thinking about, you know, what are different ways we can um, uh, improve its viability on the landscape and, and make sure that, um, you know, it, it is doing well and it's thriving. Um, right now on the Kaibab National Forest, we don't have a self-sustaining um, uh, population on this, this district that, that I'm talking about, the Williams Ranger District. We are collaborating with our partners, um, with Arizona Game and Fish Department, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, to look at sites, to do some reintroductions, um, and see where we might be successful. Um, but one of the barriers, potential barriers, is this American bullfrog situation, um, and we also have uh, uh, non-native crayfish in the area as well, um, and the potential for um, disease through uh, chytrid fungus. And we do have uh, a refugium up in the House Rock Valley area that can serve as a source population um, for some of these um, reintroductions in the future. So now I'm going to just, uh, I'll go into some of the existing efforts and the data that we have um, working in partnership uh, with others. Um, we did recently do a translocation of northern leopard frogs um, into one of our uh, natural or ephemeral uh, wetlands on the southern zone. And uh, if Susie or Audrey or Travis are on the call, they can probably speak better to that than I can. Um, but that happened about two years ago. We're also collaborating with the state on um, gathering preliminary data for this bullfrog removal feasibility study. And then we have our um, kind of surveillance and inventory monitoring um, on the ground. We have in-house crews um, that are out surveying for invasive bullfrogs. And then this past year, um, we just started kind of a newer um, aspect to the to the project where we're looking at eDNA uh, collection and analyses and how that might be able to inform things moving forward. So I'll just kind of go through some of our existing data sets here. Um, I also wanted to mention we do um, spring surveys as well. Most of our springs, our natural springs, are up on the North Kaibab. There's an extensive karst topography um, system up there. So most of our natural springs are up there. We do have a few on the south zone as well. Um, we have a partnership with the Spring Stewardship, Stewardship Institute, um, which is here uh, based in Flagstaff. Um, we've been partnering with them for about 10 years uh, to go out and survey these springs. And they do um, what's called the level one and level two survey where they'll go in a level one is really where they're looking at the physical characteristics of the sites themselves. And then um, they'll do a follow-up survey, which is, is more in depth. They're looking at um, ecological integrity, uh, cultural integrity, and then a level of risk uh, to those systems. So wanted to mention that that's just another uh, source of data that we have. This map here um, uh, represents the kind of a section down here um, on our Southern District where we have had um, field surveys for bullfrogs. Um, this is just representative of surveys um, since, uh, since la uh, about 2017 to 2021. Um, the green blobs are kind of highlighting the um, areas that we have, have found bullfrogs to be present. And then the purple area are um, other sites where we have not yet detected them. 
And um, the red overlays are kind of signaling whether or not um, we detected them using DNA or just through visual detection methods. This is another, um, just a different representation of um, some of the data in this area, also including um, some additional information from Arizona Game and Fish Department. Um, but again, uh, this area and here kind of uh, the, the red markers are kind of signaling kind of where we've had uh, bullfrog detections in the past. Um, they have been doing, Arizona Game and Fish Department has been doing um, extensive run and surveys, uh, nearly 300 now, and um, looking at non-natives and kind of mapping that area. So this is evolving and this is something we've been, we've been working on is to try and get all these detections that we have in different databases, either via the state or um, that we might, that we have on the Kaibab National Forest and trying to kind of pull it together um, spatially. And then um, as far as the EDNA goes, um, as I mentioned, this is something new. We wanted to see, you know, would it be, if this would be accurate, if this would be something that we could use to help with surveillance monitoring longer term. Um, or if it would if it would be effective. Um, so we did a pilot this last year, um, and we did find a pretty good alignment with uh, the areas that we 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 had detections of bullfrogs, where we had also historically detected them um, through visual survey methods. Um, I think they might have even detected the presence of bullfrogs in a in a in a pond that they had not previously been detected before. Um, so they were detected at 14 out of 18 sites. We also, um, uh, Rocky Mountain Research Station, I should say, is, is who we're partnering with on this. So they detected um, chytrid fungus, um, also ranavirus and some crayfish. And these, this is a, a data set that can then be added or uploaded into this national eDNA atlas that um, Rocky Mountain Research Station manages and curates. Um, and so we'll, we're going to continue to see how we might be able to fold this in um, either as a surveillance or a monitoring uh, uh, tool longer term. So in terms of um, some next steps and opportunities, um, I'll just kind of go through these. This is a kind of an overview, but we want to develop a bullfrog control plan. So that's kind of where we're at right now and um, use a predictive model incorporating um, some of that spatial data that I showed you earlier uh, as a way to kind of inform that control plan. And then of course, longer term, we have goals to reintroduce Northern leopard frogs. And then we would wanna have a survey and monitoring plan of some sort uh, for both of those. So more specifically on the modeling side right now, um, the Arizona Game and Fish Department is working with a private contractor, Genesis Enterprises, um, to identify um, some of the potential areas that um, bullfrogs might be dispersing into based on um, some of the perennial water sources that we have. Um, also to using that information to identify um, areas that we might be able to do um, removal in and then to identify potential release sites for northern leopard frog based on um, spatial uh, removal or uh, distance to um, some of these, the areas where bullfrogs could be removed. And so this model will then help, um, help us to uh, make this control plan, uh, decide, you know, are there one or more feasible areas that we might want to do, um, you know, removal? Where should we focus and, and do the, the work? Um, it will also help determine if there are other sites um, that we might want to survey for um, in terms of looking for non-natives and presence of permanent water. And then um, decide where we should focus um, releases. Do we want to, you know, concentrate in one specific area or do we want to look at, um, you know, connected uh, sites, multiple sites, maybe in, in other areas? So we do have some barriers. Um, some of these were mentioned earlier, but I'll just kind of go through these really quickly. Um, you know, technical expertise, funding, and staff capacity certainly is a challenge. Um, the need to do follow-up surveys. Um, uh, and can kind of continue with that long-term maintenance, maintenance and monitoring. 
um, public recreation and adjacent private lands. Um, we only have so much control over, you know, who is coming in and doing what on the forest, and that can be a potential vector um, to possibly uh, introduce other uh, undesirable species. Um, we have higher priorities. Um, uh, fuels reduction work, in our case, does tend to, to, to take higher priority. Um, and then there are uh, environmental drivers such as, you know, climate variation um, from year to year or then, you know, drought and flooding that might happen that we don't have, um, we don't have control over. But to leave it on a positive note, um, we also have opportunities uh, to work with our partners to get this done. Um, this is just an example of, a, of an alliance uh, that we kind of developed working in collaboration with uh, Arizona Game and Fish Department and our neighbors, the Prescott National Forest and the Coconino, um, to, you know, kind of develop a way to be efficient and partner across all landscapes, leveraging resources, and kind of thinking about things across all lands um, at that kind of landscape scale. Um, so that's a potential opportunity. And, you know, I think we have also some exciting opportunities to include community outreach and conservation education uh, as part of this as well, and use long-term monitoring tools and other media like story maps and, and various other, other tools to, you know, generate some excitement and interest and support um, from the community. And I think that's all I've got and I'll close out and just wanna acknowledge our hardworking um, field crew that's out there doing the work on the ground and um, our partners with Arizona Game and Fish Department, Fish and Wildlife Service, Rocky Mountain Research Station and Spring Stewardship Institute. And I think that's my last slide. Awesome, thank you so much, Valerie. Um, we're gonna go ahead and transition to the next presentation. Uh, thank you, Susie, for answering the questions as they came along in the chat, that was really helpful. Um, yeah, we're gonna move right along. Um, so for our next presentation, Patrick Moffat is a station manager with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and will be presenting on bullfrogs at Fish Springs National Wildlife Refuge in Utah. Patrick, unfortunately, uh, wasn't able to make it to the workshop today, but has pre-recorded this presentation um, that Matt Graybaugh will play shortly. Um, we will, however, just so everyone knows, have a representative from Fish Springs in the breakout session, um, but we won't do a Q&A. So Matt, you can go ahead and play that whenever you're ready. Okay, hey, that sounds good. Um, this worked perfectly in the dry run for like four attempts. So we'll see what happens here. Uh, Christy, as a reminder, I won't be able to go into the chat. So if you need me, make sure you text me. And Got it. Thanks. We'll start this now. Hello, everybody. My name is Patrick Moffat. I am the station manager at Fish Springs National Wildlife Refuge. I'm sorry I was unable to join you today for the conversation, but I'm hoping that I can provide you with a good introduction to the refuge and uh, stimulate the conversation and, and see if uh, Fish Springs is an applicable site for the um, the bullfrog control effort that you're that you're focusing on in this in this uh, discussion. Um, I chose this opening picture. Uh, I took this uh, the first winter I was here, and this is basically what I arrived to on my first day in January, <laughs> of 2021 at Fish Springs, and as 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 beautiful as it was uh, coming from the Central Valley of California for the where I had lived for the previous 10 years, uh, it was a, a pretty drastic change. And um, but you'll see going forward here uh, that uh, when we get to some of these more colorful slides that uh, both the black and white beauty and the, the, col um, the full color beauty of this refuge, um, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll give you a good look at um, at all sides today. So Fish Springs is a spring-fed wetland and marsh system uh, located in Utah's West Desert. 17,991 acres total. 10,000 acres of that are spring wetland braided marsh and open water habitat. And much of that open water habitat is is um, is here because of the modifications that have taken place in the in the, over the the history of the refuge. Mainly since it was uh, established as a national wildlife refuge in 1959, it's gone some rather drastic modification, which we'll see as we move ahead. Uh, other habitats include shrublands, grasslands, and alkali flats. Uh, so there's there's some interesting variation out here. Um, 
mixed into this this valley where the where the spring system occurs. And as I said, I mean, you know, the most unique thing about this place is that it essentially exists as an oasis in the middle of the desert. The spring flow is remarkably consistent, uh, does vary season to season, but over a long period of time, if you look at the da the data. Um, these these springs the flow at a very constant and, and consistent rate over time, um, and that allows us to uh, to manage the refuge in the way that we do, um, um, with the the ability to understand that we're going to have ongoing water, um, and <laughs> that in itself is remarkable given the drought conditions we're seeing uh, in the rest of the state and throughout the West. So that's um you know, a really important piece of, of, of the planning for this refuge moving forward and potentially this discussion too, because um, uh, the drawing down and, and flooding up of units is both, um, well, it's it, it's a good thing in the sense that um, we have water when we need it, but it's also, uh, because of the consistency of that flow, it's also very difficult to draw down units uh, when needed because uh, uh, depending on location, um, that can become problematic due to, the, the, to how the springs flow and how the system works. So before I bring up the details here, I just wanted to take a quick look at this photo on the left. As I said before, the reason, you know, part of the reason that we say that we're an oasis in the middle of the desert is you can really see in that photo that, you know, um, yeah, we're surrounded on all sides by by desert, and uh, to our north is Dugway Proving Ground. To the south, east, and west uh, is essentially all BLM land, and then we're this little pocket here next to the the Fish Spring Range. You can see the pink boundary there, and then that mountain range just to the west there is uh, the Fish Springs Range. In the photo on the right, you can see uh, the impoundment system. So in 1959, uh, that was the establishment of the refuge. Uh, prior to that, there's some pretty interesting history of what occurred on the property out here, and I'll get to a piece of that later on when we start talking about bullfrogs. But um, it was, uh, uh, as I said, established in 1959 as a sanctuary for, for, for migratory birds. That is the stated purpose in the, in the CCP. But um, you know, one of the, the overall goals, and also in that that same plan, is 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 to maximize wildlife diversity. So we, it's not just focused on on waterfowl and water birds, but but uh, on 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 many different species. Although I, uh, again, most of the focus over time here has been on waterfowl and water birds, uh, particularly for the first 30 years on on production. Uh, that changed over time, starting in about the 90s to um, do more, a more general management plan for um, stopover and foraging habitat, uh, less focused on production. Um, and we are currently undergoing a new habitat management management planning cycle at this time. Um, and you know that, that some of those focuses may continue to shift with that plan. We're trying to incorporate some other species that may have been overlooked over time. There's um, discussion of habitat restoration and that might come into play here um, in, in this discussion today. Um, but right now we are going through that planning cycle and we'll, we'll probably not have that completed uh, until at least later this year, if not a little bit uh, beyond that. Um, we currently have a pretty aggressive timeline for the management plan, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes based on staffing and capability. So I wanted to take a quick minute to uh, talk about the springs themselves. Uh, you can see in this photo here that the springs um, Know, kind of go along the, the lower end of the mountain range where things transition into the into the, the wetland system um, and they're all along our western boundary there the uh, the refuge holds all water rights to the springs there are no other users we have nine measured springs that feed the wetland system um, and by measured I mean that we have partial flumes set up at the outlets of each one of these springs and we convert those measurements that we take monthly um, into cubic foot per second measurements. And you see there we get, you know, on average, it's, they produce roughly 28 to 29 CFS annually. Um, flows generally from the south and west to the north and east. You can kind of see that in this picture, how it, from those spring points, we work our way out into the east up through these impoundment systems and then you end up with these, par these areas of open water that have been created over time when the water settles at each impoundment unit. Uh, the South Spring Complex over here uh, provides the bulk of the water. Those springs to the north do provide additional flows, but the bulk of the water comes from those southern springs. Um, and water is directed through, uh, the, you know, directed to each of the ind individual impoundments via a system of canals, water control structures, and various other infrastructure that kind of gets the water where we want it to be when we want it to be there. 
uh, during cold winter months, what cold weather months, excuse me, flows may exceed capacity. So we often have water kind of going out to the north and to the east into the flats um, and kind of where it historically flowed before the impoundment system was built. In warm weather months, however, that, that flow kind of shifts. And as you can imagine, we start we start losing more water than we than the output of the springs. And so that shifts and, uh, and causes those northern units typically to go dry. We can, if we want to, using that that water control system, we could put water to the north, but the, like I said, the output for the southern springs is is the bulk of the refuge. So we tend to keep uh, that water in the in the warm weather months down in those southern units um, um, close by and not having to direct it around and you know potentially lose more than we gain by by directing it north. And I'll just take a quick minute to do a little advertising for the refuge here. This is a, a, a video that I took out at Middle Spring um, last spring, and it was just you know it just shows you kind of the the, the beauty of the refuge. And then you can see the steam coming off. That the the temperature of the water out of these springs is roughly in the low 70s to, to high 70s, um, and um, varies per spring. But you can kind of see some of that steam coming off. It's really really quite beautiful. Uh, wildlife species. Uh, on our species list, we have 298 bird species, 70 of which are known to nest on the refuge, 44 mammal species, um, anything from small pocket gophers and chipmunks to all the way up to uh, pronghorn and mule deer, uh, 12 reptile species, 4 fish species, uh, 2 amphibians, including the American bullfrog and the other on our species list is northern leopard frog. I have uh, heard that uh, there are, have been anecdotal sightings of of Columbia spotted frog here. I have not, however, seen any confirmation uh, in, the, in the data that I've seen that that's been um, um, confirmed anywhere. Uh, there's no mention of them in our in our 2016 draft HMP. Um, and there's also a wide variety of terrestrial and aquatic invertebrates. Uh, you can see some of those here, including our friend the scorpion that always have to check our boots for in the morning. And I wanted just to quickly show here a couple of additional photos. Uh, these were taken by our, by our seasonal biologist, Jonathan Barth, um, last summer um, during his time here. And, and just what quickly wanted to point out some of the interesting pollinator species that you can see here. If you look at that picture on the left with the, uh, the monarch and the milkweed, if you look closely, you can really just see a, a tremendous amount of, of other other species using using that milkweed. Pretty incredible photo. Um, and there's more milkweed on this property than any place I've ever seen. It's it's pretty remarkable. We'll actually discuss that a little bit more when we get into some invasive species issues uh, in, in just a second. Invasive species um, the, throughout most of the refuge's history, and that continues to be currently this continues to be currently the case. I should say, uh, most of the focal invasive species have been plants. Um, Phragmites, kochia, perennial pepperweed, salt cedar; those are our main focal plant species. Although we do have a few others that we're keeping an eye on and, and potentially treating and dealing with. Uh, there is no current treatment program in place for invasive wildlife, uh, mosquito fish, red rim melania, um, some other mollusk species, and bullfrog are some of our invasive uh, wildlife species. Uh, in the past, there has been some, some minor efforts. Um, one was, the, was, was an attempted reintroduction of leech chub, uh, a fish species that used to be at the refuge and is now considered extirpated. That effort failed and has not been revisited and part of the issue and this might be you know this is kind of one of the issues that we face with all of the invasive aquatic wildlife species is the connectivity of the water is very difficult to control and you know one of the reasons that that least chub effort failed was because of the the connectivity between the mosquito fish and the and the, the introduced least chub so uh, when we talk about bullfrogs here in a second you know that that's something that, that we need to consider um, you know, in moving forward with, with this project is that, you know, we have some limited control, but again, going back to what, what I said earlier about the springs and the, and the way that the water management works here, um, drawing down fully in any location can be problematic, especially in the locations where we know the bullfrogs are, and I'll get to that right now. Bullfrogs at Fish Springs. Uh, bullfrogs were likely first introduced to the area as part of a farming operation in 1954. And this is a very interesting piece of history out here. Interesting and strange and, and, and perhaps a little humorous. 
uh, apparently the idea at the time was is that this person was going to build an airstrip, which they did. The airstrip is still here, and uh, build these little frog farming ponds and, and uh, produce bullfrogs for distribution to local restaurants to be frog legs on their menu. And uh, I, I guess the first piece of this that is kind of funny to me is considering Fish Springs local to anything is is uh, a bit crazy it's 60 miles um from delta it's 200 i mean excuse me 100 miles from tuella and it's you know salt lake city is well beyond that all these areas to the east and southeast and and um <laughs> yeah just very strange but uh I, I guess unsurprisingly the operation failed and uh, five years later the, the refuge was established um but there's still like i said there's still some remnant ponds out here and and unfortunately now we are also left with the bullfrogs that were introduced to the area as part of this operation jumping ahead about 45 years a bullfrog and northern leopard study was completed at the refuge in 1999 by a group from brigham young university and other universities in the region uh, and there have been no formal surveys since that time i included a link to that study here uh, and that can uh, be distributed to the group um, to hopefully follow up because I do think that study uh, covers quite a bit of ground that I'm not going to attempt to cover it all here, but I do think it should be reviewed thoroughly uh, if we are to pursue this effort any further at the refuge. What it shows, and just a quick summary, is that while bullfrogs are established in select areas of the refuge and may have some impacts on other species, the harsh environment seems to be a limiting factor. And I can can confirm this from what I've seen on the ground in my time here, at least anecdotally, that what it shows is that the, the, the frogs are, are well established in the in the areas that are in the canals and spring system in the southern part of the refuge. And beyond that, they do not seem to have been able to push outward into the wetlands themselves. Um, and I, like I said, I can I can confirm that I I have not seen. In fact, I can't see remember a single sighting. Um, outside of that canal system or outside of the lower units next to the South Spring complex. And that's potentially both a good thing and um, an issue for any control effort. The good thing is, is that again, they're localized. They don't seem to have pushed out to the extent where it would be very, very difficult, um, even with a large effort to, to control them. But the problem is, is that that area is also the same location where we have very little water control. Uh, the springs flow constantly and the design of the system would make it very difficult to draw any of it down for any particular length of time in a way that, would, that, would, that wouldn't that would harm the rest of the refuge management. So I just wanted to be upfront about that um, before we move forward that if, you know, if the method of control um, that were preferred were to ha have to involve drawing down the water, that may be very, very difficult. Um, the other thing that the study does point out is that additional variables may, play, may be in play to, that are limiting the population growth. Um, it's just not fully uh, discussed or studied in that in that particular document. So, um, moving forward, you know, some closing thoughts. I mean, at this time, bullfrog eradication is not a high priority effort for the refuge, uh, and it's you know part of that is just being that we are very small staffed and they do not seem to be causing too many issues um, at this time. Um, but I think a starting point potentially would be new surveys to determine the abundance and distribution to, you know, kind of confirm what we, what we think we already know and what impacts they may be having on nat native species or any of our, our resources of concern. Um, the 1999 report, like I said, is encouraging uh, that it's seemingly, you know, that, that they seem to have limited distribution and, and that may, may make um, control efforts more feasible. This group will obviously know much better than I would about um, how feasible potential control is. Um, however, water control is limited in the areas, as I said, uh, where the current population is established, and that, that is going to be a, a, a difficult problem. Um, and the refuge has very limited staff and funding. So if this, you know, if this project were to continue and it wanted to be pursued, then it would, yeah, would require commitment on both fronts from from outside stakeholders, because I can, I mean, I have to be honest about this, just in terms of practicality, we, we do not have a lot of staff time to put into this effort. Um, we could certainly help in any way that we could, but I need to be clear uh, <laughs> that with a staff of, a permanent staff of two, and, um, you know, occasionally um, some, some seasonal help, that's all we have out here, and managing 17,000 acres with that um, day to day becomes, um, it's a challenge in itself, and, and pursuing, um, a large scale control effort is is probably not doable with with just just on our own. So um, 
Yeah, I, I, I think that hopefully provides a, a good introduction for you. Um, I want to go ahead and and uh, get this plan here. I do some final advertising for the refuge before we close out. Uh, I put our contact or inf information here. Please reach out. We're certainly interested in pursuing the conversation and want to be as helpful as we possibly can. And as you're watching that on the left, this was a day recently in January of this year where I went out and I just noticed the clouds above racing by, but it was dead still on the ground. And I uh, decided to take a time-lapse photo as I went around and do the um, time-lapse video, excuse me, as I went around and did the water work. Uh, beautiful day out here. And uh, um, thought that might be a nice way to close out.